you'll uh, recall that in our session yesterday, I had concluded with a brief picture of the circumstances in which the 1941 fight between Local 544 and Tobin, the general president of the Teamsters International, was to take place. Uh, I had observed that Tobin was not eager to get into another fight with Local 544 because past experience had demonstrated to him that it would be a fight. Also, because he was uneasy as to how deeply the international as a whole would be affected in such a fight. But at the same time, he was prepared to subordinate all union considerations to his role as a bellwether for Roosevelt in helping to regiment the workers for American entry into World War II. Just as Tobin demonstrated by seeking to negotiate a compromise with the leadership of Local 544 that he knew it would be a fight. We were wholly aware that in all the circumstances, failure to concede to Tobin's demands to place an international receiver over the Union would mean that this time we would experience an all-out attack from Tobin. For that reason, when a committee from the local union, headed by Ray Dunn, was sent to Washington in the spring of 1941 to meet with Tobin and the International Executive Board, the committee went there with a double assignment. In the meeting with Tobin and the executive board, their instructions were not under any circumstances to make any concessions to Tobin on the full autonomy of the local. In short, to reject his demands that the local union voluntarily accepts the imposition of an international receiver over it. They were also instructed to go to the United Mine Workers headquarters while they were in Washington and see if they could get a charter from John L. Lewis for Local 544. They carried out both assignments. It's an interesting little touch, the circumstances in which they were able to see Lewis. After they had been in session with Tobin and the board for a while, some hours, Tobin announced that he wanted the 544 delegation to excuse itself while the board had a bit of an executive session about the problem and trying to play the host and wanting these brothers from the sticks while they're in Washington to see the best. He asked them if they had seen the United Mine Workers headquarters, just newly constructed. It was the labor showpiece in Washington. No, they hadn't seen it. So he got on the phone and he called over to... Uh, uh, one of the officials of the mine union headquarters and said he's sending some of the brothers from Minneapolis over. They'd like to see the headquarters and he'd appreciate it if the United Mine Workers would show them the courtesies. So they went over, 
While they were there, they got an agreement from John L. Lewis to give Local 544 a charter. Now, the kind of charter that was received from Lewis is interesting. The basic component, of course, of the United Mine Workers Union was the coal miners themselves. Uh, after the, the uh, break with Roosevelt in 1940, uh, Lewis stepped up the development of what they call District 50 of the United Mine Workers, a catch-all formation to take in most anybody they could get into the United Mine Workers that some other union didn't have or didn't want. And within District 50, they had a subdivision known as the United Construction Workers. And 544 received a CIO, CIO charter from Lewis in the Construction Workers Department of District 50, a sub-department of the United Mine Workers of America, a coal miners union. The committee came back to Minneapolis with the charter and meantime they had gotten the final word from Tobin when they went back after they'd been to the mine workers headquarters they, they, they got the final word of the results of the executive session of the uh, uh, Tobin's uh, board that it was either accept a receivership or fight so Upon their return, a general membership meeting of Local 544 was held, and the whole situation explained, thoroughly discussed, and by an overwhelming vote in a packed meeting with just a scattered raising of hands of a few individuals here and there, the membership voted to return Tobin's charter to him and accept the charter from Lewis. And as of that night, it became Local 544 CIO. Everything hinged now on how far Lewis was ready to go. I mentioned that Lewis had broken with Roosevelt in 1940. He broke in criticism of Roosevelt because of his policy toward labor, that he wasn't doing right by the unions, as measured by Lewis standards, not from a revolutionary point of view. And let it be known that he was going to stand opposed to Roosevelt's re-election in 1940. He was quite a showman. He dramatically waited right till election eve before he announced his stand, there was a great deal of speculation and a great deal of hope that in opposing Roosevelt, he would come out for a Labor Party. But on the eve of the election in a national radio broadcast, this is still before TV, he came out for Wendell Wilkie, the Republican candidate running in opposition to Roosevelt. And in order to try to give the maximum weight to his appeal, he stated that if Roosevelt were elected, he would have taken it as a repudiation of his leadership as the president of the CIO, which he was, and would resign. Well, Roosevelt, as you know, was reelected, and Lewis did resign. Philip Murray replaced him as the head of the CIO. Lewis now is in open opposition to Roosevelt, unlike Tobin, who is doing the chore of helping Roosevelt prepare uh, the workers for war. And Lewis had very great authority among the workers. And although he had uh, uh, no small degree of limitations, is essentially a class collaborationist in his mentality, he had made some 
important contributions to the breakthrough nationally of the old outmoded AFL craft structure and the development of organization and the creation of the CIO in basic industry. And with a charter in the CIO, with a man like Lewis, who had the authority that Lewis had in the eyes of the rank and file workers throughout the nation, with the record local 544 had among the militants in the Teamsters Union, and with the demonstrated accomplishments through the class struggle policies that the leaders of 544 followed as they had been uh, uh, revealed in life through the organization of the over-the-road structure, as I described it to you last night, there was an excellent chance of getting a big response against Tobin inside the International Brotherhood of Teamsters if Lewis was ready to go all out. Moreover, there was still a good deal of struggle momentum within the Teamsters Union as a whole. The lull that was to, was to come a few months later had not yet set in. And in these circumstances, quite a battle could be made. But Lewis gave us little more than a charger. It was kind of like handing you an umbrella that was full of holes. And in the chain situation, it was absolutely precluded that we could fight to a stalemate against Tobin as we had done in 1935-36 with a local union standing against the Teamsters International in these chain situations. In short, unless Lewis was ready to go all out, which he wasn't, Local 544 really didn't have a chance. Now, even with strong Lewis action, we would have faced the war issue in new form later on. This is the spring of 1941 that I'm describing now. In December of 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Lewis took the lead among the bureaucrats throughout the Union movement and marching in a body to the White House and giving Roosevelt a no-strike pledge. And, of course, in changed form, our cadre would have been under new pressures to support the war as part of the leadership of the Union movement. But at the same time, there might have been some new tactical possibilities for us in the chain situation. Not much point in going into those because the whole question is moot for the simple reason that Lewis didn't come through and we had to go it alone. <clears throat> Tobin's attack on us developed swiftly and it came massively. The first thing that happened, the bosses got wind of what was coming. A whole series of the key contracts the union had with the bosses were expiring and coming up for renegotiation, and the bosses stalled everywhere in the negotiations. And we were forced into strikes under highly unfavorable conditions in these circumstances. And if there's any doubt in your mind as to whether or not the conditions for a strike we're going to be unfavorable. I think I can resolve those doubts for you in the next few minutes as I tell you uh, in bullet form what happened. You remember I remarked during the discussion period the other night, this tactics of whether you strike one or more and one, that's not, a, that's not a strategic question, it's a tactical question. And whereas we had started in 34 by first taking all the coal yard bosses on, and then next, next taking on all the trucking bosses in Minneapolis in these changed circumstances in 1941, we were very careful and very selective to just make a small test strike in some of the areas where we felt 
that the circumstances were best for us from a tactical point of view, and we were equally careful not to step right out and pull all the drivers out on strike uh, at one moment. The stalling on the negotiations and the forcing of the local into strikes on this basis was immediately followed by an influx of Tobin goons. This time it wasn't just a relatively small force of the kind that came in in the spring of 1936 made up of a few case-hardened bureaucrats and some hoodlums here from Chicago, uh, Tobin put the loyalty test all up and down the international, and he put it to everybody on the international payroll, and he put it to everybody in the leadership of a local union that had aspirations of getting on the international payroll, and he put it in the framework of patriotism, loyalty, red-baiting, and uh, he got results. The town was flooded with goon squads coming from various Teamster setups around the country acting for Tobin. And many who came were from over the road locals in the 11 state area. Now it's important to note that those who came from the over-the-road locals were not, in general, from among the best of the militants that had carried the ball in the battle I described to you last night whereby the over-the-road structure was consolidated and the bosses brought to book. It was more comparable to the description I gave you last night of how they got this fake reproduction of the Committee of 100 organized in Local 544, the Johnny-come-latelys, the reactionaries, the opportunists, those riding the gravy train. Our friends, the militants in the over-the-road locals, were pocketed and under heavy pressures in their situation, just like we were at this juncture in Local 544. And the result was that the fight very quickly boiled down to a battle between Local 544 on the one side, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the bosses, and the bosses' government on the other. And when I say the bosses' government, as you will see, I mean the works. Here we are confronting Tobin's goons on the streets. Street clashes develop between not only the 544 staff, but uh, the stewards, the best of the militants in the union. And in every one of these clashes, the cops were neutral on the side of Tobin's goons. If some of our guys were getting the worst of it in a given, given scuffle, the cops couldn't see a thing. But if we had the upper hand on the goons, they were right in there making arrests. And just like Mississippi, <laughs> they arrested the local 544 members like in Mississippi, they arrest the Negro that is, that is being attacked by, by, a, uh, by a racist. There was a law on the books. Uh, we called it the Stassen Slave Labor Law. It was the anticipation in the state of Minnesota of the Taft-Hartley Act that was to be passed nationally in 1947. And the Stassen who was then governor of the state of Minnesota is the same identical Stassen who gets into the Republican presidential primary contest every four years. This law was invoked to decertify local 544 CIO from the right of representation of the drivers and inside workers organized into the union, and by decree of the Stassen administration, the Tobin setup was recognized as the formation having sole bargaining rights. The bosses very quickly signed up contracts with Tobin's receiver that he had imposed in this form. All this 
being done in a suite of hotel rooms downtown. Then Tobin's lawyers came in and with the collaboration of the ruling class got a court order giving Tobin title to the 544 headquarters, its treasury, and everything down to the last postage stamp and paper clip that the union possessed. And now the police department, armed with this, moved in in force and we had to give up the headquarters. We just couldn't hold it. We couldn't win that kind of a battle. Then they went into the state courts and swore out a warrant and got the collaboration of the police prosecutors to frame up Kelly Postal, the secretary treasurer of the union, on a charge of embezzlement. The union, as I explained to you, had voted the night of the membership meeting to send Tobin his charter back to accept the, the Lewis charter, and we'd had some legal advice, and the necessary motions had been passed authorizing the secretary treasurer to change the bank account, transfer the funds, and so on. The, the boss's courts helped Tobin to cut through this whole thing and indict Kelly Postal on a charge of embezzlement. Kelly Postal was convicted and he served five years in the state penitentiary at Stillwater, Minnesota, working in the, in the hemp mill. And he <coughs> was not the only victim. They initiated a deportation action against Carl Skoglund, who had come originally from Sweden, had not been naturalized. Threw him in jail, at first would give no bond at all, finally set a $25,000 bond. And it was at this juncture, in these circumstances, that the deportation action against Skoglund started, which, although they never succeeded in throwing him out of the country, was to plague him until the day of his death, just a few years ago. Then the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, made a public statement in support of Tobin in the Minneapolis situation. Then one bright summer's day, the FBI raided the headquarters of the Socialist Workers' Party in Minneapolis, and they found there a red banner that we used to drape the podium on May Day. They found pictures of Marx and Engels and Lenin and Trotsky and the Communist Manifesto and Lenin's work, State and Revolution, works by Trotsky and other things. And all these were seized. The next day, the front page of the paper has got big sensational pictures of all this radical stuff, red flag and all. Shortly thereafter, a federal grand jury indicted 29 of the leaders of the Socialist Workers' Party and leaders of Local 544 CIO on two counts. The first count was a charge of conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States right here and now. And they used for that a statute that had been enacted during the Civil War and aimed at the slaveholders of the South. And it is a historic fact that we were the first, and so far as I know, as yet the only people in the United States of America ever to be indicted under that law. The second indictment was under the Smith Act charging us with advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence and fomenting insubordination in the armed forces. We were brought to trial later on, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Meantime, I want to call to your attention a footnote, and I deliberately handle it as a footnote, as I have on previous occasions. From 
The summer of 1939, just before World War opened, when the Stalin-Hitler Pact was signed, up until June of 1941, the Communist Party had been opposed to the entry of the United States into the Second World War. And their principal slogan was, the Yanks are not coming. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and the next morning, the Daily Worker, the uh, organ of the Communist Party, came out with the slogan, the Yanks are not coming too late. <laughs> A few days later, we're indicted, and the Communist Party made a public attack on us in Minneapolis as agents of Hitler, as fascists, and they called on the government to convict us and put us out of the way so we couldn't harm the war effort. Browder was in jail in, in Atlanta, Georgia at the time where he was serving a hitch on a charge of falsifying his passport. Robert Miner, the one-time famous cartoonist who became a complete Stalinist hack, was the acting national secretary of the Communist Party. And he made a special trip to Minneapolis just as we were getting ready to go to trial to address a public meeting where he called upon the whole labor movement of Minneapolis and Minnesota to support the government against us in the thought control uh, trial that we were about to face. The Communist Party had considerable influence within the CIO in Minnesota, and they did everything they could to try to put CIO unions on record in support of the government against the leaders of Local 544 that were just going to go to trial on this Smith Act charge. The 544 membership, on the other hand, in the main, and by that I mean those cadres of steel that had been forged throughout the Union in the battles from 1934 up to 1941, and the best of the young workers that had come into the industry and had responded to the education given them by the veterans of the general strikes of 1934, stood firm in the face of everything, everything from Tobin's goons down to the indictment by the federal government of the leadership of the Union for advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence. And it became necessary at this point for the leadership to take the conscious act of leadership of recognizing that the Union had had it, that we couldn't win, and not light-mindedly and unnecessarily and foolishly take militants who would nevertheless continue to battle on down in a, in a uh, bitter fight to the end and make unnecessary victimizations. We had to act, rather, just as a conscious leadership does in a losing strike situation. One half of leadership technique and capacity in a strike is to know how to organize and lead a battle to win. Another half is that if in a given set of circumstances it turns out that it's not in the cards for you to win and you're going to lose that battle, then it's important to, to try to get at least some of your best militants in under the wire be before, the, uh, before the axe falls so you got something to start with to fight another day. And from that point of view, we called a meeting of the membership, and it was a meeting one would never forget. Once again, as we had done right from the shaping of the first demands in, in uh, preparing the way for the organization of the first strike seven years before that, there was a thoroughgoing discussion and debate and sadly, but and resentfully, 
but like fighters who had been around and fought enough, they knew that not everything is romantic about the class struggle. The rank and file saw the facts of life, and it was agreed that they would go and apply for admission to the Tobin setup with the understanding that this was the best way in this losing situation where we didn't have a chance to be able to fight another day. None of us dreamed then that it would be so many years before there would be a new opportunity to mount the battle in terms of the kind of battles that took place in the 30s that I've sought to describe to you. But nevertheless, the strategy and tactics of the Union at that point were correct in the situation, the only thing that could be done. Now, from the party side, we recognize similarly that we had to face the worst consequences. We had to take it for granted that when we went to trial, the trial opened in uh, November of 1941, we had to take it for granted when we went to trial that it was entirely possible, if not probable, that we would be convicted and there was a clear and present danger that we would go right from the courtroom to jail because everything in the air indicated then that we were right on the eve of American entry into the World War. And we were certainly correct because, as a matter of fact, the jury brought in the verdict against us on the 1st of December, a Monday. The judge set the following Monday, the 8th of December, for the sentencing. And the day bef we went, before we went back to that courtroom to get sentenced, we're sitting around the party headquarters having a little social, drinking a little beer, playing a little cribbage, got a little music on the radio, and all of a sudden the music stops and the announcer cuts in in an excited voice, the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor. How do you imagine we felt that morning we walked into the, the, the quarter? We thought that judge was going to put us away so deep they wouldn't find us until some archaeologist 300 years from now started looking around and see what's under the dirt. <laughs> Uh, anticipating these possibilities, the party held an emergency conference right here in Chicago in September of 1941, just before we were to go on trial. And held it in order to prepare for all eventualities. Remember now, most of the top leaders of the party, as well as the whole top leadership of the Union, are indicted and are going on trial. And we had to assume the possibility or even the probability of going right from the trial to jail. We didn't have time to organize a full convention of the party in the constitutional manner that the party follows of setting a period of at least two months for a full and complete internal discussion within the party in which every member of the party has a right to raise any question he wants to and all matters are thoroughly discussed before the convention gathers. We didn't have time to do that because the federal government wasn't going to wait. So we did the next best thing using the constitutional mechanism of our national committee which, as I remarked to you in, a, in, a, in, a, in an earlier point in the discussion in describing how rank-and-file democracy functioned in Local 544, is organized in such a way that nobody can get on the committee unless he can get the votes in the ranks of the party. And that means that, by and large, when the National Committee meets, it's fairly representative of the party. That was the formal mechanism. But to make doubly sure, we arranged also for delegations of rank-and-file members of the party of whatever numbers could be available to come and sit in at the conference and while constitutionally they couldn't have a formal vote in, the, in these uh, circumstances to cast a consultative vote. So in, in this emergency form we were, we were getting the most complete democratic determination 
by the party of the question before us. Who shall be selected as the substitute leadership if things go for the worst in the Smith Act trial and the present leadership goes to the prisons? And on this basis, members of the party who had not played such leading roles before were co-opted into an expanded leadership structure to meet the emergency situation. And when the 18 of those who had been originally indicted did go to prison, the secondary leadership stepped in and carried on. And the party as a whole responded solidly to the needs of the time. Now, in the trial that followed after this plenum conference where we made these emergency arrangements for continuity in the leadership of the party, only 28 were in the prisoner's dock when the trial opened. One of them, Grant Dunn, had committed suicide between the time of the indictments and the time of the trial. Uh, you might, sometimes you have an opportunity to look in the bound volume of the 1941 militant. You will find a eulogy that was delivered at Grant's funeral that undertakes right then and there in the heat of the times to explain why this happened to this man who had played such a heroic role in the, uh, in the struggles of the earlier time. All all those on trial were found not guilty on the charge of, of conspiring to overthrow the government here and now. That was a little hard to prove, that you're going to overthrow the government of the United States with the primary mechanism of the, of the self-defense formation <laughs> that I described to you the other night that had been created in the Union to protect it against fascist hooligans who were threatening to break windows in Union headquarters and bust up the Union's editorial offices, one thing and another. All were found not guilty on that. Uh, the criteria was this. The party, in effect, was put on trial. The evidence introduced against us ranged from the Communist Manifesto, written by Marx and Engels and published uh, uh, almost 100 years before we went on trial, down to articles that appeared in contemporary issues of the militant. In other words, nothing but ideas were involved. And the criteria set was the party is guilty of advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence. The question of whether or not each individual defendant is guilty is determined by whether or not the government can prove he's a member of the party. The government put in its case in the first half of the trial, and when the government rested, the judge dismissed the case concerning five of the defendants on the grounds that the government had failed to put in any serious evidence that they were members. And 23 went on through the trial, and the cases of 23 went before the jury. The jury found five more of the defendants not guilty on both counts, their criteria being that the government had failed to prove to their satisfaction that the five they found not guilty on both counts were not proven members of the party. Eighteen were found guilty and sentenced to the penitentiary, uh, a, a few for, uh, for a year and a day, most for 16 months. As you can see, we got a very pleasant surprise when we went before the judge the morning after uh, Pearl Harbor. And there were probably three basic reasons for the lightness of the sentence. One, it was a mass trial. You can picture the scene. 28 prisoners in the dock as of the time the trial opens and ideas on trial. It didn't create a good impression. There was a lot of uneasiness about it. Two, we found that the jury had been deadlocked. The jury was out almost two solid days and we learned from some of the jurors after it was over that they'd been deadlocked. That there were two or three of the jurors that just couldn't stomach the idea of putting people in jail for their ideas and they wanted to vote not guilty. But a majority of the jurors were just as determined to vote guilty and we learned later that they, they, they arrived at a deal, a compromise in the jury. 
in which those who wanted to hang us on both counts were compelled to agree that everybody would be found not guilty under the first count, the charge of conspiring to overthrow right here and now, that convictions would be only under the second count, the Smith Act, advocacy. Nobody would be convicted unless it was clear that the government had proved beyond the peradventure of a doubt they were a member of the party, and even in coming in with the guilty verdict, the jury would recommend leniency. And that's exactly the way the verdict came in. A little contradiction, you know. The form of the jury gets up when the question is asked, has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. What is the verdict? The jury finds so and so and so and so and so and so finally comes down, reads the list of the 18, guilty of advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence. The jury recommends leniency. <laughs> and this brought, the, this brought the third factor, that in all the circumstances, and a real wartime witch hunt uh, uh, atmosphere hadn't whipped up yet, the judge saw no alternative but to, but to give moderate sentences. But I can testify that 16 months in prison is long enough, and I don't advocate longer time. This test in 1941 gave a real measure of the party cadres. Here's a cadre that had led and won a virtual civil war against the boss class. Here's a cadre that had beat off repeated attacks by the Union bureaucrats. A cadre that had created this magnificent class struggle instrument in Local 544 and had made a vanguard contribution to the whole labor upsurge of the 30s. Here's a cadre, those in the Union especially, that the Union movement had become a way of life to them. Not the Union movement in the sense of the well-fed, fat-headed bureaucrats that sit on top of the Union today. Not that kind of a way of life. But a way of life for a person that wants to work selflessly and devotedly for social progress, organize and help to lead the working class in carrying out its historic role as the engine of social progress. That kind of a way of life. And now they face defeat and they faced isolation. They faced government persecution right then and there in the form of this thought control trial. And afterward, they faced an employment blacklist that lasts right down to this day within Minneapolis. But there was no alternative for revolutionists. There was no alternative. A revolutionist had to act that way. But even so, it was a test of fire for the cadre and a test of fire for the party, a test of fire for that many-sided interrelation between the great ideas of a program for which the party stands and the caliber of the education of those individual human components of the party which give flesh and blood to the program in the person. And the record shows that not a single renegade turned up among the party union. The party as a whole came through with flying colors. The party as a whole came through the whole test with flying colors. And that's a shining example and a deep lesson for revolutionists today. It's a glorious chapter in the history of the party within the larger framework of the history of the class struggle in this country. Showed itself a party of class principles. 
a party of class truth, a party made up of people who had absorbed those principles, who believed in those principles, and who knew how to stand by the truth and how to take the consequences. The biggest problem facing us in general at that juncture was the question of the war. There was a deep-seated hatred of Hitlerism, of fascism, within the general population, within the working class as a whole in this country. And it was very hard for them to understand why it wasn't correct for the working class to be supporting the imperialist government of the United States in a war against fascism. Our problem, our effort, was first to try to demonstrate, to explain, to discuss wherever, whenever, and as best we could with the workers what fascism is fundamentally. Fascism wasn't a German admiral. Uh, the final acts of desperation of the ruling class in striving by all possible means to cling to its privileged position and its dictatorial rule over society when that is threatened by a growing mass of the population headed by the labor movement that wants to change society, to abolish capitalism and go beyond it to the socialist society. And to discuss and explain Yes, fascism has to be fought, but it's the job before all others of the labor movement to fight fascism, and you can't entrust that task to any section of the boss class to discuss, to try to explain to the workers that the object of American imperialism in going out to defeat Hitler and Mussolini and the Mikado of Japan and the ruling classes of those countries in the name of a holy war against fascism would be to displace them as the top imperialist dogs exploiting the peoples of the world. And they're really demonstrating to the hilt today that that was their aim. That you're not fighting fascism in the name of something that must be fought. You're being tricked into serving the interests of yet another imperialist gang of exploiters who are equally capable of trying to impose fascism upon the working people of the United States in a developing class struggle aimed to overturn their rule and take away their special privilege. That we had to try to explain. We pointed out also to the workers in every way we could that one of the first manifestations you will get of the duplicity of, the du of, uh, of Roosevelt and the whole ruling class for which he is a spokesman in taking you into this war is they're going to make you pay for this war right from Taw as well as go out and do the fighting and dying. And you know, as a matter of fact, it didn't take long for that last point to become increasingly obvious to the working class. Uh, shortly after the war began, Roosevelt, who was almost as good as Walter Ruther at getting some high-sounding formula, you know, to uh, fog everything up in, in the name of some principle that's about as tangible as a wisp of smoke going through the air, uh, Roosevelt come out with the big slogan, Equality of Sacrifice. We're going to make it equal. He's got a twist now, you know. You know, this wage price bind that the boss always starts squawking about, you know, the minute the workers ask for a raise. 
You think all the corporations are really mercenary institutions and never made any profits. You know, profit has got nothing to do with it. It's just wages and prices. So the gimmick is they're going to impose price controls and they're going to impose a wage freeze. Well, they, uh, they set up uh, 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 an Office of Price Administration, was known as the OPA. And they announced that they were putting ceilings on prices. What happened? Well, it was kind of like the description I give you of the way Olson enforced the Haas Dunnigan terms when he had his tin hats on the street. They start out with the form, and then they start opening a little here and opening a little there. It was no time at all until a black market appeared. And the first operation of the black market is a two-sided one. On the one side, the people that got the bucks, they can get anything. And since they'll pay whatever price uh, can, uh, is, is levied in the black market, more and more goods tends to flow to the black market, and the areas where price controls are maintained uh, become marked by shortages. So uh, suppose you're out for a hog. The question of whether you get a roast or a chop or a jowl or the tail is determined by whether you go to the black market or to the butcher shop. And other little, uh, other little gimmicks they put in. Well, they, then, then they begin to find hardship for the capitalist merchants and they'll make a hole here and there in a price ceiling. And once in a while, uh, maybe take some 10th uh, some, uh, rank operator in the black market and throw him in the pokey for six or eight months. I remember while we were in Stir in 1944, uh, there were two or three out of a population of five or six hundred in the prison that wandered through. They'd been caught in some kind of a two-bit black market operation. Uh, you know, it's like it is always with the cops. They go out and arrest some little guy on the fringes to make it look like they're on top of the situation and let the real swindlers just go right along because there's a payoff. The same thing here. That was on the price side. But on the wage side, it was the other way around. You never saw such energetic, diligent, thoroughgoing uh, efforts on the part of the government to carry out a policy to the letter. And so here the workers find themselves caught in a bind where the cost of living is steadily going up, uh, goods are coming more and more into shortage, part because of the war as a whole and part because the best is being skimmed off into the black market at, uh, at robber prices that uh, workers couldn't touch, and there isn't a change in their wages. In other words, they're taking wage cuts right and left, and it's getting rough. And they couldn't see much equality of sacrifice about it. And there was a good deal of restiveness in the ranks. And finally it broke into the open in 1943. And the United Mine Workers led the battle. There was a, uh, the wage freeze was in the form of a decision that had been made by the War Labor Board in, in uh, the question of renewing a contract in Little Steel. And they set a criteria, kind of like Johnson's gimmick today, you know, that you can't have inflationary wage increases, uh, a, a, a percentage gimmick that, that locked up wages lagging behind the steadily rising prices. And it was called the Little Steel Formula. This was the instrument for freezing wages. The miners went into negotiations at the beginning of 1943, and they ignored the little steel formula and their demands. The government insisted they would have to settle on the basis of the little steel formula, and they said no. And here something happened that was unprecedented in American labor history. In the year 1943, right in the middle of the Second World War, the coal miners went on a series of national strikes in a running battle that lasted for months. And they'd, they'd be out a while and they'd come back and then they'd be out again and they'd come back. And they operated on two slogans, essentially. One, either equality of sacrifice or equality of opportunity. It wasn't in those words, but that's what it boiled down to. In other words, in other words 
you can't just freeze our wages and let the prices skyrocket. And the other was, you can't dig coal with bayonets. It wasn't a new slogan of the mine workers, but they really brought it. Here again, let me give you a little footnote. The Communist Party finked on the coal miners in 1943 just like they had finked on us in the Smith Act trial in 1941. Denounced them as agents of Hitler. They weren't the only ones. The Union bureaucrats as a whole denounced the thing. They were as timid about that as they are about the victimization of, of, uh, of uh, people like Hoffa today, where the bosses are out picking this or that, this or that official when their real aim is the unions themselves. They were just as timid about it then. They were nervous strike. Uh, now, here is a note that I, I think it's important to make about John L. Lewis in this connection. As Lewis has demonstrated throughout his life, he's a class collaborationist. He does not operate in class struggle concepts. But there was one thing about Lewis that made him stand head and shoulders above the average union official. Lewis was one of those rare specimens within the class collaborationist union bureaucracy that had the capacity to conceive of the workers as a power and had, had the facility and, again, that commodity I keep mentioning, if I'm going to finally convince you is important, had the guts <laughs> to use this power. Uh, it took a lot of guts. I have many, many criticisms of Lewis, many, many criticisms, but I admire that guy, and no matter what happens, I'll never forget that in the year 1943, in the middle of the Second World War, he led the mine workers as a power, as a labor power, in a long-running clash with the whole power of the federal government. And in that battle, they smashed the little steel formula, busted open the wage freeze. And as you know, one uh, good turn deserves another. Uh, one good example leads in the class struggle like in Genesis, you know, to the begats. You know, Abraham begat Jacob and Jacob begat Isaac. Uh, one good example in class action with some results, begets another one. By, uh, by 1944, wildcat strikes were beginning to develop throughout basic industry. Uh, following the example the miners had set, on the one side aiming their fire against the wage freeze, trying to take advantage of the, of the gap the miners had, uh, had, uh, had rammed into the, uh, into the wage freeze wall, and parallel with it, there was a pronounced rise in the appearance of sentiment for and resolutions in favor of and calling for the development of a labor party in 44. The war is still on. Now, there was a third interesting thing that happened in 44. We're in prison now. We went into prison. We celebrated New Year's Eve between 1943 and 1944 by, uh, by going to prison. We're in prison at this time. And among other things in the fight, we've, uh, we've made a demand of Roosevelt pardons. A defense committee has been organized, and a campaign is on to get petitions signed by individuals and resolutions adopted by unions calling on Roosevelt to give us a pardon. He didn't do it, but what happened is interesting, interesting in a double sense. We got support in the form of resolutions adopted by unions representing hundreds of thousands of members in the year 1944, while the war is still on, calling upon Roosevelt to pardon us. Here you are, conditions of war. We're in prison on the charge of advocating the overthrow of the government by force and violence, and hundreds of thousands of workers through the mechanisms of their unions in basic industry are, are voting for resolutions 
calling on the president to pardon us and let us out of prison because class struggle is coming back in the air. Now, the second point I want to make there is just note. Suppose we had gone to prison to serve our 16 months immediately after the trial. And suppose we had been in jail in 1942 instead of 1944. We would still have made the pardon demand as part of the political fight against the capitalist government for jailing us for our socialist ideas. But we wouldn't have begun to get the kind of, of solidarity in our pardon petition in 1942 that we were receive in 1944 because objective conditions were beginning to change. Now with the end of the war, there was an unprecedented strike wave developed, an absolutely unprecedented in its scope, in its magnitude. But before I speak briefly about that strike wave, I want to touch on another thing that happened that in the last analysis was intimately related with the new upsurge of labor. In no time at all after VJ Day, demonstrations began throughout all the theaters of war across the world by the American troops demanding they be demobilized and brought home. Their thinking as expressed can be boiled down to this. All right, we agreed we had to fight this war against fascism. You didn't give us too good a shuffle while we were gone. Now the war is won. The purpose of this army and the purpose of our being in it no longer exists. Bring us home. This was the mood of the troops. It was echoed by the families of the troops within the country. And as happens in periods of struggle, always somebody, you know, with an eye to put things short, sharp, and to the point, comes up with a slogan that catches on. And in no time at all, after the first troop demonstrations began, a slogan emerged in the kind of language that all politicians understand, no votes, no votes. Put us on those transports and take us back or don't expect to get reelected, buddy boy. <laughs> That's what they were telling these capitalist politicians. Now the demonstrators within the armed forces that were demanding that they be brought home and demobilized were principally and primarily the workers in the ranks of the army and the organizers of the demonstrations were principally and primarily men who had been job stewards, picket captains, local union officers in the preceding days of the battles that gave rise to the CIO. as a case of putting union know-how to work to a good class purpose under changed conditions. This kind of like, you remember I told you the slogan that we used to try to inculcate into these, these young uh, over-the-road truck drivers coming off the trucks and becoming union negotiators, and they'd ask, can we do this, can we do that? We keep repeating to them, you can do anything you're big enough to do. At least these, these workers who had been the rank and file leaders, at least in the, in the lesser uh, 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 positions in the, in the rise of the CIO, they had learned in their experiences in industry this notion, whether or not put that way, you can do anything you're big enough to do. And they weren't as overawed as, for instance, a 30-year career man in the army would be with the seeming power of the general staff. Now, let me note one more thing about the troop demonstrations before we come back to the strike wave. Not only was the United Mine Workers' Strike of 1943 an unprecedented class struggle action in the history of the United States of America, 
The troop demonstrations after VJ Day were unprecedented in the whole history of the human race. Why? I challenge you, I challenge you to go back through the pages of history and find a single case where a victorious conquering army, army faced mutiny in its ranks the day after victory. And that's what the troop demonstrations were. It was mutiny, if you please. And don't you think there weren't a lot of brass hats around in the fall of 1945 and spring of 1946 that wouldn't have liked to have put the firing squads to work against these non-coms and PFCs and others in the ranks of the armed forces that had this background union experience that were organizing these demonstrations. And it's a, it's a demonstration on the one side here again of the power of the working class and a demonstration also of the capacity of the working class to assert itself to be ingenious about it, to be inventive, to be creative, to be bold, and to be determined. When they reach the decision, the time has come to act. And that also is the history of the working class. Don't ever make a sweeping judgment of what is fundamental to the working class on the basis of what you perceive of it at a given moment. Judge the working class, don't judge. It's a little presumptive to judge a whole class within society. I use the wrong word. Study, try to understand the working class is a better way to put it on the basis of the totality of the historic record and see the motion of things. In your own life, you know, uh, you get in a pretty rough way if you don't get a certain uh, number of hours of sleep and in 24. Now, see, your problem with respect to a class in evaluating it is that the motion of social forces in class terms are utterly indifferent to that all-important question of the individual of the length of his life and what is going on at the moment, meaning no offense. Uh, let's take an insect. I'm not gifted enough in science to, uh, to uh, be able to name a specific one, but I have heard, it wasn't told to me, but I've heard, that there are some insects that, that are born, mature, and die within two or three hours. Uh, see what I'm getting at? If you evaluate social forces, on the basis of what happens just within whatever the gamut of your lifespan has been up to this moment, or out of impatience because it isn't doing what you think it ought to do if that's what it's historically capable of doing, while you want it done, you kind of get in the position of this insect that was born, matured, grew old and died, we'll say between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. So he goes to wherever insects go and they die, and somebody says, what about the human race? And he says, the bastards sleep all the time. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> now the, the workers demonstrated a tremendous power. The strike battles opened in the main with, uh, with a strike of the General Motors workers that began within the month after VJ Day. If memory serves me right, it was underway before the end of September. VJ Day was toward the latter part of August, 1945. Became quite a battle. And it, the, the uh, significant thing here is not what happened in the GM strike itself, although it was one of the focal battles. The significant thing is that Following GM, paralleling it, came strikes of steel workers, strikes of coal miners, strikes of electrical workers, strikes of rubber workers, strikes of truck drivers, strikes of, tr of, uh, of food workers.
in basic industry alone, at the crest of the 1945-46 strike wave, over two million workers were on the picket lines at one time, along toward the crest of the wave. Am I right, Hank? It was long about January, February of 46, wasn't it? It reached the crest. Now, some two million workers we're on the, we're on the uh, picket line at one time. And what a power. What a power. Now, the bosses didn't even make an attempt to try to break any picket lines. You know, the only real skirmish, if you can call it a skirmish, that took place in the strikes was that here and there, you know, some high echelon of management thinks he ought to go into the plant and see if there's a faucet leaking someplace or whatever high echelons of management do when they go into a struck plant. And the workers just out of pure contrariness, maybe, or because they had nothing else to do, or they wanted to, they wanted to say that when they mean tight, they mean tight, they'd say, you ain't going in. Oh, the cops would come down and they'd try to make a show, you know, management, you got to let him in. Maybe the workers say no. Cops try to shove him in, sometimes the workers would slap the cops back. You know. There wasn't a big thing, but that's really the only kind of uh, struggles there were. Wasn't any problem at all of, of running Finks in. And the biggest disappointment the bosses got from the point of view of the question of Finks was the men out of the armed forces. Throughout the whole war, they had these orientation courses. Well, they're about like you run into the plants, you know, and they call you to a safety meeting. You know, the whole object of the thing is here, we don't want you killing one another, you know, unnecessarily. Which means don't kill one another unless it's necessary in order to get out the necessary production the boss wants on a certain day. Call a safety meeting. And you get a little talk about safety. And you get a little infusion of company propaganda and one thing and another. Throughout the war, the so-called political orientation courses in the armed forces were shot through with anti-labor lectures. And maybe you think the ruling class didn't go to town on the United Mine Workers when they struck in 1943. They were doing their best to try to convince the rank and file of the armed forces that this proves to the hilt unions are no good. Look here, they would say, you're here fighting and dying in these trenches, in these foxholes, in these submarines, these battleships, these bombers. And these guys who have got it soft, all they got to do is dig a little coal, they're striking for more pay. That's what unions are. You can just imagine, you know, what a good, a good demagogue can do with a situation like that. It adds a little touch of delicacy to the refined, striking, breaking role of the Communist Party, that they were saying the same thing in the Daily Worker that the brass hats were saying in, the, saying in the orientation courses of the troops in the army about the minor strike. But with all this indoctrination, and it, it comes as no surprise, certainly, after I've described to you briefly the nature and circumstances of the, of the uh, demonstrations demanding the uh, demobilization after the war, the veterans of World War II didn't come out of the army anti-union in the droves. They came out of the army and onto the picket lines of the 1945-46 strike wave. And they were some of the ones that were rather eager and impetuous about slapping the cops around because they'd just gotten quite a college education in the art of slapping people around with the government picking up the tab all the time they were in the army. You had a tremendous solidarity of the class. All that was lacking was leadership. The solidarity was so great that the middle class, the same middle class, same generic social force that from whose ranks today you hear so many pundits chattering about how labor can't lead social advance, the middle class has to. Same middle class was just caught in the vortex of this labor struggle 
like people are sucked into the wake of an avalanche in the Alps. Harold Ickes, the curmudgeon, Secretary of the Interior of the Roosevelt administration for a long time, a big wheeler dealer in top circles of government, accepted the chairmanship of a committee of middle-class intellectuals to raise money to help support the General Motors workers whom the General Motors Corporation was trying to starve out. They were on strike for long as many of them. The corporation was trying to starve them out and down. Just that one single example indicates the impact on the, on the middle class. I remember well a plaintive editorial in the New York Times. They're very balanced, you know, very objective, see all sides of every question as long as it's the boss's side. And they were deploring the breakdown of, of the great American norms by the emergence of what they said, this modern concept that it's a crime to cross a picket line. This permeated society under the, under the impact of the great labor struggle to the point that this was, this was the effect in all sides. <clears throat> now, in these circumstances, it had become crystal clear to thinking people then including many, many thinking people in the union movement that were not revolutionists, as symbolized by the fact, for instance, as I observed, that beginning with 1944, more and more local unions, and occasionally here even a token gesture from an international union developed, particularly within the CIO, calling for the formation of a labor party. It was clear that pure and simple unionism had reached a definitive dead end and that it was necessary for labor to break with the capitalist two-party system and take the road of independent class political action. But it happened. The bureaucrats were able to block the way to an independent labor party and the upsurge of 1943-46 again stopped at the union level and didn't break through the political barrier of the capitalist two-party system and take the class political level in the name of labor. The result was that the upsurge gave way to the Cold War and the witch hunt, which I don't think I have to describe to you because we now have arrived on this fourth night at this point at that climate in the United States with which you are reasonably familiar because that is the climate that has existed throughout the whole conscious life of the young people present in this gathering tonight. There's been 18 years of bureaucratic bankruptcy in the union movement. And as I've tried in every way I could think of on the basis of demonstrated facts of the struggle history of the working class across the years we've discussed in these four talks to demonstrate, it is not a crisis of the capacity of the workers to struggle. It is a crisis of union leader, leadership. Now today, superficially, the relationships between capital and labor appear relatively stable. But as I remarked in a previous session, that apathy is a relative thing and change can be taking place without your being able to perceive it at the moment, even where you see a relative stability in class relations, a relative equilibrium between labor and capital, that's not the whole of the picture. 
there are internal alterations occurring that are generating instability at the very moment you see you think you think you see essential stability just let me mention three of these one the economic attrition that finds its expression in the growing problem of chronic unemployment its persistence its rise the growing economic security felt by people who have still got employment that is that whole circumstance whereby modern techno technology is being applied in industry to advance the good and welfare of the profit picture of the boss at the increasing expense of the working class as a whole. That's one. Another, the threat of nuclear war. The Korean War, the record I think shows, is the most unpopular war up to the up to the present situation that the United States ever fought. Now the war in Vietnam has not yet reached the scope and intensity that the Korean War reached, although the gang in Washington is working overtime to push it in that direction if they can. What you saw in the reaction of the Korean War, I mentioned the coal miners in 43. One of the things that typified the Korean War was that many unions, following the old maxim, go thou and do likewise, proceeded throughout the Korean War to go on strike when they weren't satisfied with the outcome of a negotiation like the miners had gone on strike in 1943. The criteria was not that Truman said it's a national emergency and everybody's got to sacrifice or we can kill more Koreans and Chinese. Their criteria was, all right, what's the, what's the powers of being in this country done for us lately? In the Korean War, even the railway switchmen went on strike, in case you didn't know it. And the railway switchmen are not exactly one of the most militant bodies of workers in the United States of America. This growing apprehension with the realization that these madmen in Washington are toe dancing three quarters drunk along the precipice of a nuclear holocaust and people know there's no place to hide why the tension during those terrible hours there for a few days in the Cuban crisis of 1962 when those Soviet ships were heading for Cuba Kennedy had ordered the fleet out there to stop them everybody knew the United States has got nuclear weapons the Soviet Union has got nuclear weapons will or won't the Soviet ships stop Will or won't, the American forces open fire on them. Will it or will it not lead to a nuclear war? Will I be alive this day next week? That was deep in the minds of a lot of people. Now, there's another aspect of this that's important to keep in mind. I'm talking now about these forces that are operating underneath the surface that generate instability in circumstances where visually appears there is stability. Now we're sitting here, a lot of street noise going on out here. Or you can be in any kind of a situation where there's a lot of noise. And we have a catchphrase, a fanciful notion that we become accustomed to those things, don't we? But medical science tells you it's not so. You've been affected more than you realize you have. You're just not aware of it. And it may not ever be known because the result might not be such as to cause you any particular trouble. Science tells you that about this. That's the same, in that same essential sense, and I'm speaking about this fundamental aspect 
of the threat of nuclear war, the effect it's having on people. Now, I've mentioned on several occasions concerning radicalization that when people are holding their own or feel they got a chance of getting some reform, a few concessions in due course, they tend not to radicalize and not to struggle. It applies for the ruling, for the working class. It applies in all forms of social struggle. But there's another factor that comes to bear here. It does not necessarily take a catastrophic blow to break the stability and precipitate mass action. The constant attrition of these processes that generate a sense of fear, a sense of insecurity, a sense of instability can trigger an explosion. It does not necessarily take a shock of the depth of the depression in the 30s to precipitate another labor upsurge. And finally, there's the effect, the impact on the working class of the dehumanizing trends that are being imposed upon the people of this country under this outlived capitalist system that long ago passed beyond that brief moment in history where it played a temporarily progressive role in helping to take organized society out of the, out of the, uh, the feudal system onto a higher capacity to produce and advance technology. Long ago has passed beyond that, is outlived and is rotten ripe to be tossed into the dustbin of history and replaced by a new, higher, emancipating socialist form of society. But in trying to cling to its special privilege and its rule, the capitalist class is more and more dehumanizing people. And this has its repercussions in many ways that introduce instability. Maybe I can sum it up by just quoting briefly a passage from one of O'Hara's books that he writes, the novels he writes about the middle class in eastern Pennsylvania. That, in my mind, in its own way, just kind of epitomizes the norms of human relations that capitalism as a whole is trying to impose upon people. This is a Saturday night party. Of, of a gathering of middle-class men and women that are doctors, dentists, merchants, one thing and another in this little eastern Pennsylvania town. And they get together, and as is the custom, husbands and wives don't sit next to one another. They're, they're mixed up so that, that, uh, that uh, uh, men who are, are sitting next to women are not their wives, and women are sitting next to men that are not their, uh, their husbands. And this little vignette, is inserted by O'Hare at this point. The lady sitting says to the man on her right at the table, are you one of my husband's customers? He said, no. She said, then get your hand off my leg. <laughs> I think it just epitomizes the norms that capitalism is setting for society as a whole. Meaningful capitalist concessions to the working class are no longer in the cards in any way, shape, or form. Instead, there's an intensification of labor exploitation, and along with it, a three-pronged boss offensive against the union movement that is running deeper all the time. On the job, the rat race of the speed-up, the return more and more to the old tyranny of the open shop days before the CIO is becoming increasingly the norm in basic industry. All that's different is that the union bureaucrats are performing some of the functions that the sub foreman used to perform 
of ratting on and backing the bosses up and disciplining the workers that don't cut the buck by the boss's criteria. When a contract expires and the union comes in with demands for a renewal of contract, the bosses are there with counter demands to take away something. And more and more are government controls being imposed on the unions. Not only the Taft-Hartley law, not only the Landrum-Griffin law, but in the generalized form of the terror the government is sowing among the bureaucrats by the arrogant way in which they're slapping out at a union like the Teamsters in the form of this vendetta against Poffer, who is not, not the uh, sine qua non of a union leader. But that's beside the point. Off his shortcomings, his weaknesses, the question of whether or not he should be head of the Teamsters Union is a thing to be decided by the Teamsters Union. And in the name of trying to protect workers from crooks, isn't that an irony? The government of the biggest gang of crooks in this country, the bosses, in the name of trying to protect the workers from the crooks, got this vendetta going against Hoffa and the object is the Teamsters Union. And by these terror campaigns in which the bureaucrats fall all over one another in reputing, condemning, and goddamning whatever official or whatever union comes under attack, even without passing a law, they're imposing more and more the iron hand of government control on the workers and all this is just preamble to codifying the thing in laws that'll be even more heinous than the Taft-Hartley Act and the Landrum-Griffin law. From another point of view, every time there's a partial union struggle, every time there's a partial union action, it has the force and effect of posing to thinking people the fact that larger issues are involved and that nothing can be settled except on a larger scale. And in this situation, the union movement, the working class, is going to be impelled toward a new upsurge of struggle. The unions are going to be pushed in the direction of the formation of an independent labor party, breaking with the capitalist two-party system. The need for a change in and leadership is going to become plainer and plainer to the rank and file of the workers. Rifts of new kinds will be precipitated in the bureaucracy in the general nature of those I described to you that were utilized in the struggles in Minneapolis and breaking in to get a class battle going. And it will open new possibilities for militants to step forward in the union movement as they did in the 30s. From another point of view, there's a two-sided aspect of the Negro struggle that should be kept carefully in mind in this regard. One side of it is the bureaucratic crime of helping the white supremacists split the labor movement. I could mention many categories, but I'll mention just one. What a crime it is not to have made the kind of a fight that would, would go in the direction of removing the fear of unemployment by using the power of labor to see that labor gets benefits instead of unemployment out of technological progress. What a crime that instead they really think on the Negro struggle by saying to workers who are concerned that, that equality of employment will mean putting Negroes into white workers' jobs and on that narrow axis of personal concern are susceptible to white supremacist propaganda. When I say susceptible to white supremacist propaganda, I don't mean they become prejudiced. The average white worker 
has prejudice against Negroes. Everybody knows that. It flows from the whole history of the land and the relations of people within the land. But the crime is in the fact that the Union bureaucrats, and I mean starting with the very top echelons, are neither counteracting the white supremacist propaganda nor leading the kind of a fight that would both overcome the fears of the white workers and meet the just demands of the Negro workers, in short, serve the interests of the working class as a whole at the expense of the boss class, which is where the payment ought to come from. Well, the hypocrisy of the union bureaucracy in their failure to really support the freedom now struggle as a whole on all fronts <coughs> is another factor that touches on the problem of the working class today. Now looked at in the second aspect. Parallel with these difficulties for the civil rights struggle because of the, of the traitorous policies of the Union bureaucrats is the impact of the Negro struggle on the Union movement. Now, you know, Negro workers today, when I say Negro workers, let me just say parenthetically that I don't speak in the sense that only Negro workers are involved in the civil rights struggle. I don't say that middle class elements among the Negro people are not in their own way. Uh, uh, militant and becoming more militant in this battle, I use this expression in the sense of recognition that predominantly and their overwhelming majority, the Negro people as a whole, are of the working class. It's in that large sense that I'm now using the expression Negro workers as well as particularly with regard to the presence of a Negro worker per se in a union. The Negro workers are of the same category as the workers that I described to you in 1934 that formed the battle detachments of the truck drivers that whipped the cops down in the market. And what is that? They're people that have got little or nothing to lose. And sometimes, you know, that can make quite a battler. That's one factor that's going to impinge in more and more ways in the movement. Moreover, the Negro worker, in addition to being a part of the general fight in this society as a whole for full social, economic, and political equality for uh, minority peoples in all spheres of society, is making a fight for his rights on the job and within the union. And this will have its effects. As a matter of fact, it is becoming more and more the case and it, will, and it will be noted by more and more workers, I think in time, militants among the white workers, that in many respects the Negro movement is already fighting the battle of the white workers for economic security and, yes, if you'll please, for union democracy. And from another point of view, the mass action that is developing within the civil rights struggle is a highly contagious thing that is going to more and more find its reflexes in the union movement as a whole. And in this overall situation in which more and more instability is being generated within this surface appearance of stability in class relations between the workers and the bosses, the struggle of the Negro people will tend to serve as a catalyst to precipitate a new labor upsurge. And in doing so, it'll drive new and deeper fissures into the labor democratic coalition and push the labor movement in the direction of the formation of an independent labor party. Now here, the labor movement is not as atomized today as it was in the 30s. It isn't necessary for the working class first to gather itself together at the first elementary form of organization, the union. 
as, as was required in the 1930s. The workers are not wholly organized. There's a lot of workers that could and should be in the unions that are not now in them. But there is ample organized union power at hand right here and now to become the tremendous central dynamo for projecting the working class and all the allies of the working class onto the political arena in its own name with its own party. And the basis is there then for a swift leap once the process starts beyond the framework of capitalist two-party politics to the formation of an independent labor party. Now, militants, revolutionary militants today are not in a position to summon the workers of this battle, saying to them, this is what is necessary and this is what you must do, now let's come and act. Much less to say in a position to try in any way, shape, or form to substitute some other force for it, not yet in a position to challenge the bureaucrats for union leadership. The relation of forces as yet is a little too strongly against the militants. And we can't predict yet when the upsurge is coming. But come it will, that we can be certain. And the central theme of everything I have tried to communicate to you in these four talks in terms of a piece of the actual struggle history of the working class is to communicate that realization that not everything that you see is exactly what appears to meet the eye. Something is changing. Younger people who have never had a chance to see this class in motion will find in coming times that there's something there you couldn't have dreamed were present and that once it starts to move you are going to be not only an eyewitness to but a part of what is going to be one of the most tremendous chapters that has ever been written in the history of the human race there are two titanic powers in this world today that are central to the final showdown as to whether society on this planet is going to be driven back to barbarism under the rule of capitalism, madmen with the nuclear bombs, or whether it's going to go forward to a socialist society. One of those powers at the center of the determining point is the ruling class of the United States of America. It is a power not because that power is inherent in the ruling class in the sense it's able to throw it around today. The ruling class is a power because it is able yet to manipulate the greater power power of the American working class to its advantage. And until that brute force, the ruling class of the United States, as represented by its minions of the Republican and Democratic Party in Washington, are removed from power and replaced by the working class power, this world is going to face the danger of a nuclear holocaust and the qualitative breakthrough of mankind to a world socialist society is going to be prevented. Therefore, in the last analysis, because of this fact, the ultimate fate of the human race is going to be definitively settled right here in the United States of America in a clash between the capitalist ruling class and the working class. And those of you here who are 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, I envy you. I envy you because unless you get run over with a 10-ton truck, you've got a very good chance of being a witness of and a participant in 
what is going to prove to be one of the greatest, the most triumphant chapters in the history of the whole human race. And meantime, in everything that you do, in trying to build toward the realization of the socialist cause, for all the reasons I have tried to state,